of Scotland. I'm Hugh Stewart, along with my colleagues Jeanette Hill and Devon Alexis. We're going to look at some of the top stories that we've um, come across this week in the first week of April. So thanks for joining us. Now, in a few weeks, I'm, a few minutes, <laughs> I'm going to discuss the hate crime bill which came into effect last week. And Jeanette has a story. Crime in Glasgow is it as bad as they say it is? And Yvonne's going to look at the super hospital in Glasgow. Um, there's a report out there. Uh, we've also got some more stories coming up on um, Scotland and health. After that, we're going to have a discussion about some of those stories. And we'll... Okay, let's go straight into Scotland's short stories for this week. Now, we don't have anything from the Scottish Parliament, and that's because they're on their holidays. Uh, there's a couple of stories up from um, the Scottish Government. Though, first of all, bees in crisis. The Scottish Government is concerned about the invasion of the yellow-legged Asian hornet. This, um, this invasive species could threaten the bee population, which al- already has um, other, uh, other issues affecting it. And, of course, bees are vital for our biodiversity. Now, you're being asked to spot uh, any examples of this bee, and if you can find one, then you've got to report it to the Non-Native Species Secretariat. Now, I didn't know that there was such a body, so uh, we're all better informed now about that. So the NNSS has an app that you can download, and if you see anything that you think looks like a yellow-legged Asian hornet, uh, get that report in. Uh, the, the Scottish Government is saying we need to monitor statistics on these. They've been seen in north of England and all over Yorkshire. Uh, so I don't know if they're here yet, but probably they're on their way. OK, now let's move on to Tartan Week in, uh, in America. So Angus Robertson will be at the airport again quite soon. Since 1998, the American Congress has officially recognised their links to Scotland in the form of the Tartan Week. The actual Tartan Day is on the 6th of April, a couple of days after we record this show. And there is um, the march through, I think it's Washington, D.C. There's a, a, the kind of Scottish equivalent of the St. Paddy's Day march takes place. So Angus Robertson is going to represent Scotland and he's going to see if he can um, make some business deals there. So it's not only the cultural links, of course, but also um, to try to improve business links. Scotland and, and America, of course, have enormous links, including um, a lot of inward investment from America. So that's why he'll be there. Now let's move on to football. Scottish people are often complaining that Scottish national football games are not actually on the telly, at least they're not on the free-to-view. So if you have a free-to-view box and you're in the habit of watching the BBC, I think some people still do that, then uh, you might well find that there's a Scottish game on at Hamden, down the road from here, but it's not on the telly. However, you can watch an England game. Now I don't know how many times recently I've heard people complain, our team is at Hamden, but we can't see it, but we can watch England in their friendly against the Faroe Islands or whoever uh, they're pitting themselves against. So that's um, that anomaly is because uh, Scotland's um, Scotland's uh, games are sold by UEFA uh, or the other authorities and are sold to the highest bidder, so the BBC basically hasn't paid for it. So we don't get the ordinary qualifying games for Scotland, uh, but we do get f- <laughs> um, finals. That's not much use to us, actually, if you're a Scottish fan, because we don't appear in finals very often. Anyway, this week, Hamza Youssef has said that uh, with the uh, European con- uh, competition coming up in Germany later on this summer, it's about time to look again at can't we get Scottish football onto the telly. It's a reserved matter, of course, so the Scottish government has no ability at all to decide what you, what you see and you hear in Scotland. Those issues are reserved to the government in London. OK, finally, in our quick stories today, an extra £300 million for the Scottish Health Service. Hamza Youssef has announced this week that uh, the first 30 million out of that 300 million is going to be released. And what they're trying to do is to um, reduce waiting lists, some of which are still a hangover from COVID, but they're also trying to generally increase productivity. And the rest of the 300 will be rolling out over the next year or two. So uh, the Scottish Government points to an example of the treatment centre in Kirkcaldy, which was set up recently, and that has created extra capacity to deal with 540 orthopaedic joint operations. So they're looking to spend the money on things like that. Yvonne has another health story coming up in a few minutes. OK, so uh, next it's me. OK, um, right, so we will have stories from my colleagues shortly, but it's time to discuss the hate crime bill, as you've probably heard. The, um, the Hate Crime and Public Order Scotland bill actually came into force this week, as we're recording this, in fact, a couple of days ago. And it has attracted more controversy than you usually get for a new law. Passed originally by the Scottish Parliament in 2021, the Act was delayed while Police Scotland and others tried to figure out what exactly it means. First of all, here's what the Act said. It's an Act of the Scottish Parliament to make provision about the aggravation of offences by prejudice, to make provision about an offence of racially aggravated harassment, 
to make provision about offences relating to stirring up, stirring up hatred against a group of persons and also to abolish the common law offence of blasphemy. So that last one was a, a tidying up of a historic act that really wasn't used. Aggravation here means an offensive act or statement can attract a tougher penalty if the act was aimed at somebody in one of the following characteristics, that is age, disability, race, nationality, religion, sexual orientation, transgender identity, or something called a variation in sex characteristics. No, I don't know either. Now, if you look at, for example, a racist rant or attack on somebody, it could be a crime if it was intended to cause alarm or distress because the victim was a member of that racial minority. And if found guilty, the culprit can, can face a fine, of seven, a fine and seven years in jail, or indeed both. So, should we avoid upsetting people because they're not white? Well, the law does say that reasonable statements can be made and are not unlawful. It would be up to the court to decide what is reasonable. And the Act also reminds us of the European Convention of Human Rights, which allows freedom of speech, even if the words used may offend, shock or disturb. This is what they call a high threshold for criminal prosecution. Also, much of this law, including the setting up of neutral reporting centres and police collecting statistics on non-crime incidents, does follow on from previous law. For example, women with a complaint about sexual abuse or rape may find it very difficult to walk into a police station, especially if they are in a controlled relationship. Members of black and ethnic minority or non-Christian religious groups may also hesitate to go to the police. So, following the appalling, the appalling murder of the 18-year-old Stephen Lawrence in London in 1993 and the failure of the London cops to investigate properly, new codes of practice were set up, partly to deal with institutional racism. Police Scotland makes it easy for you to report. I checked yesterday. On the first page of their website is a, ta- a tab for reporting hate crime. On another page, you can read how to report a non-hate crime incident. And we're advised... Uh, We are advised that if you do make a report, it will be fully investigated. Now, Hamza Youssef has talked about a rising tide of hatred in Scotland, justifying the new law. We at News News for Scotland, we thought that Scotland was an open, friendly and welcoming country. So is it? Well, the Procurator Fiscal's Office reported in 2023 that the total number of charges connected with hate was 5,738 of which, that, that's, that's by the way, 2% less than the previous year, of these racially motivated hate crime was the highest total at 3,145, but that's also 2% down, but 31% lower than its peak in the year 2011-2012. There were also 1,884 cases of sexual orientation, that is anti-gay crime, and 722 cases of hate crime against disabled people, 576 uh, cases of unlawful religious pre- prejudice. Transgender identity crime totaled 55. By the way, England and Wales, up to 2023, recorded 145,000 hate crimes. As England's population is 10 times the size of Scotland, roughly, you'd expect the equivalent number there to be something like 57,000 cases rather than 145,000. So is Scotland's hate level really rising? The debate this week about the new law almost entirely focused on hate against transgender citizens, But media sources, for example, can say that a trans woman is a man, and we know that because J.K. Rowling said it on Monday. She said it several times on her Twitter X account, and on Tuesday, that's yesterday, the polis said they would not be pressing charges. So the level of proof for a criminal case is much higher than that. So it's not a crime, but is it a non-crime? The polis are following UK guidelines in keeping records of these anonymously reported non-crime incidents. Although the informer's name will be kept secret, the named person will go on to a police file and the name could come up if they're looking for a job in the public sector. An enhanced disclosure will will reveal the names on the register. So how many qualified applicants will not be interviewed because of a complaint that they may not even know about? It's early days in the life of this new law. Already we hear that thousands of non-crime incidents have been filed down at the station, and we suspect they're probably not about wheelchair access. MSP Murdo Fraser already found his name on a police file. As we reported last week, he thinks that's against the law, the Data Protection Act, for for one and possibly others. So although the law is well-intentioned and says nothing about these unintended consequences, maybe the guidelines the cops are working to need a bit of tweaking. Finally, I'm wondering if the law can make us better people. Martin Luther King Jr. once said that morality cannot be legislated, but behaviour can be regulated. 
you know, he went on to say, the law cannot change the heart, but it can restrain the heartless. But he was talking about lynch mobs in Scotland. Who are we lynching? Thanks very much for that, Hugh. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about a report uh, made by Glasgow Live. So Georgian Shepherd in Glasgow Live in the 25th of March revealed a startling headline which said that uh, Glasgow Central was a hotbed of crime. It opens up with shocking statistics have revealed Glasgow Central is the most violent train station in Scotland as crime has risen 31% in the last year. Now this is a Reach Scotland publication which is a subsidiary of Reach PLC based in London and this group is the largest newspaper, magazine and digital publisher. Glasgow Central is, of course, Scotland's busiest train station, so it's not really a shock to expect that it would have more crimes than any other Scottish station, just based on passenger footfall alone. And according to British Transport Police, statistics say that crime in the station has risen by nearly a third in 2022. So Glasgow Live misses off, though, that definitions of crime given by the British Transport Police because they label it into antisocial behaviour or indeed violent crime. Now, a lot of antisocial behaviour people wouldn't think of as crime. For example, sticking the cone on the heed of the Duke of Wellington is seen as antisocial behaviour. But most people in Scotland would probably just laugh at that one and wouldn't really be worried about it. However, Glasgow Live suggests that between March 23 and February 24, 224 instances of crime were detected, up from 170 the previous year. Violent incidents, it says, went up by a third, meaning that I think we had 10 more, I think, in the, in the year, from 68 to 78. Waverley had, a, according to, to Glasgow Live, 72% rise, according to them, and that, of course, is Scotland's second busiest station. And it's so a staggering rise of 72% because violent crime went up to 52. That's 52 instances in the year. Now, I would question the word staggering rise here, given we're talking about 10 more incidents than the previous year. Having tried to squeeze through Waverley in the festi- festival time, I'm amazed at that. And I think how incredibly well behaved all those millions of tourists that head to Edinburgh every year are. And how incredibly well behaved the locals are <laughs> for putting up with them. <laughs> anyway, so what we're saying really basically is logical that Glasgow Central is the busiest station. It's logical that they've got the most reported crime. And actually, if a train has a crime on it, the crime isn't reported till it gets into its destination station. So obviously that's for many stations, for many trains coming to Scotland, that is Glasgow Central. And also when you look at we're coming out of uh, COVID-19 restrictions, it's entirely predictable that crime has risen a little bit in train stations since then. But obviously 224 crimes, if it's your stolen bag or your stolen phone, they're 224 too many crimes, absolutely. And then we're looking at assault, well, obviously, that's not something that you want to see. But I'm, However, I'm saying, you impartial listeners, <laughs> can you decide, is it a cause for alarm, as the writer suggests? Or is this another instance of talk down Scotland in the mainstream media, owned by the few? and controlled from London. The rest of the UK stations, for example, have all shown an increase in crime, especially the busiest stations. And the British Transport Police website says, crime statistics need to be viewed in context. Sometimes it's reported as a crime, but when it's investigated, it isn't actually a crime at all. Yeah, And when we look at on-train crimes, we can't always say that's happening in a station. And we have to be so wary of these crime statistics and how they're used. Also, I would say the ongoing rail disruption in England, is that not a crime? (laughs) Which we're not having here, but never mind, we won't go into that one. And a very good point the British Transport Police are saying is crime statistics are not an accurate indicator of risk. If the writer of this article had also looked at Manchester Piccadilly, the headline might have said, Glasgow Central safe, but don't go to Manchester Piccadilly, that's an absolute hotbed of crime. (laughs) Because crime has risen from 800 in 23-24 in Manchester Piccadilly, from 527 the previous year. But when you think it's got 13 million passengers going through it, I would say you're all right down there in Manchester as well. 
So the headline alone sounds awful, but we've got to look at statistics, obviously, in context. And these statistics contribute to that fear of crime, and that's a problem for us. And that's where I take umbrage with Glasgow Live's report. Because as British Transport Police said, hundreds of millions of passengers make safe journeys all the way through our train stations, all the time, all over Scotland, and without any incidents happening. And actually, Strathclyde University research shows that long-term trends for crime in Scotland are, are down. Yeah, There's a marked decrease in violent crime. In Glasgow, for example, there were 10 homicides, 21-22. This represents a 47% drop from 2012-2013. And this happens all over Scotland, this drop. The Numbero Crime Index says Glasgow ranks 49th in the list of European cities. Bradford is the first in this index. Number two is Marseille. Am I saying that right? Coventry is the third and Birmingham is fourth. So three out of the top four in the crime index cities are in England. Seven out of the top 15 are in France. And even Malmo ranks higher than Glasgow. Who knew? I blame that bridge to oil-rich Norway. Imagine the headline in Glasgow Live. That staggering hotbed of crime Malmo, shamed in International Crime Index. Given the owners of each PLC own so much mainstream media, perhaps Glasgow Live aren't as invested in local or even Scottish interests as it appears. Now over to Yvonne for a report on the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. HIS also known as Healthcare Improvement Scotland, had to apologise last week for failing to take any account of a complaint by 29 doctors, which is in fact almost every consultant in the hospital's emergency department, that hospital being the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital, to discuss concerns it had raised regarding practice in the hospital and staffing and other areas of concern. <clears throat> One consultant who signed a letter told told us that we'd exhausted all our options and thought HIS was a credible organisation. We offered to share evidence of patient harm and were shocked that they ignored this and didn't engage with us as a consultant group raising concerns. HIS has, has now uh, closed the complaint after speaking to executives at the hospital rather than actual working doctors and consultants. They have said that there was awareness and oversight of the issues and of the performance of the emergency department. However, having failed to take into account the views of those working on the ground in that area, there's some concern about exactly what they intended by areas of concern. This this failure to listen to doctors and consultants has happened in other parts of the country, not simply in uh, Glasgow. And it is important, I believe, that the people working in practice should be being heard and addressed rather than the senior executives who have often a vested interest in essentially pretending that everything's fine over here and we're not having any problems because these issues are a large safety concerns for the health of patients and visitors and patients' relatives who are in A&E departments. Frustrations can get high and tempers can be raised and often it is simply a matter of a lack of staffing and other available resources to ensure, for example, that the four-hour waiting list time which is required by the government, is actually adhered to. There will, we'll be talking more about this later in our discussion. OK, those are our main stories for this week, so we're going to discuss that now. And I'll just tell you what we're doing for the rest of this week's show. We're going to um, go outside uh, shortly, and we're going to speak to some people in Glasgow, and we'll ask them their opinion on 
Uh, we're going to seek the opinion of people in Glasgow about the stories we've been talking about today. Uh, so we, um, basically we've got a new camera and we're going to use it. <laughs> uh, but while we're here, because it, it might be raining, so while we're inside nice and warm, right, um, let's look at them. Uh, let's take up that last story. So we've, been, we've had two stories on health. Now, is the super hospital in Glasgow, as it's sometimes called, um, is it, in your opinion, is it thriving? Is it succeeding? Is it, um, you know, a f- it's one of the biggest hospitals anywhere in Britain, isn't it? But uh, are we being too harsh on it? I think we can be too harsh, but I don't think there's any there's any reason you shouldn't criticise the mm. hospital. But I do think often it is being over criticised. Mm. If you were looking at the bigger picture of other hospitals across Scotland and the U- the wider UK, um, it's it's got the vastest number of patients coming through it in in Scotland. Um, because they, they decided in their infinite wisdom to cut down the actual hospital availability in the country. So the Victoria on the south side, Gartneyville, it's the, the western, closing them all. Gartneyville is still open, but the western and the Victoria. Mm-hmm. Um, there is Glasgow Royal, but it's, it doesn't take in like as much as the Queen Elizabeth because the, the area is vast and it also gets incoming people from the Highlands and Islands. Um yeah, there's uh, a helico- helicopter there's a, land- yeah, landing yeah, pad yeah, on the roof. Yeah. At, uh, I think there is a trees. danger that people, you know, sometimes Glasgow people just moan for the sake of moaning to a certain degree. But, but you know, yes, there are definitely genuine issues. Yeah. There's no denying that. You know. And it's right that we sh- that people should be listening. The problem with that that little report is they weren't listening to the practitioners yeah. on the ground. Mm-hmm. And absolutely, I agree with you. That it's, do you think it isn't a problem all over England? Of course it is, but that isn't right. They should still be listening mm-hmm. to those poor, overworked you know, uh, guys and lassies in, in A&E. And that's right. You know, the, as you said, the centralised A&E, and it's, it's not exactly mm-hmm. been made it easy. But there is, I mean, we're, we're dead short of staff, and that's another th- issue, isn't it, really? Uh, I was you in know. myself uh, quite recently uh, because of, I can't even remember, what was it in for? Something was <laughs> chest, wrong. Chest pain after your long and, journey. Um, <laughs> oh yes, I was there quite a while, but they uh, kept, I was offered cups of tea and sandwiches uh, yeah, yeah. and I was attended to, people came in to see how I was doing. I was not just abandoned in there, yeah. but because of the staff shortages, yeah. obviously, they couldn't allocate somebody to immediately deal with my issue, but I wasn't in a life-threatening position. I don't feel... Yeah, aggrieved yeah. about that. I yeah. understand that they had more uh, serious issues to deal with, and uh, you have to come. You know, if they're triaging, they have to deal with the more serious incidents first. So there, there's that aspect of it. But absolutely, yes, they shouldn't just ignore letters from their consultant mm-hmm. team. Yeah. That's just wrong, and yeah. it's, it's missing the point, really. Like you said, it's admin led, really, and it, there's, we see no problem here, and they. People on the ground are saying there is a problem. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I agree with that one. Okay, well, we we just move on. And uh, yeah, you talked about Glasgow people mourning. Yeah, we'll go outside and um, give them the opportunity to do that. Now, um, uh, Jeanette, what do you think about the hate crime bill? Is uh, first of all, let's deal with this business of is it needed? Is Scotland um, the most hateful country in Europe? I, I, I don't know. I don't feel qualified to say if we needed to know. I sort of have a bit of faith in our, uh, our legislators. If that's the right word, I think fair enough. If they think we need it, you know that's how my position. What I've seen when I've been looking up is this incredible right wing absolute attack. YouTube full of these, you know, neo fascists in my opinion, attack on on Scotland for the for this bill and and personal attacks on Hamza and I think that is, as far as I could see, quite a lot of was. was was racist stuff against Hamza, making a fill of his name, and this guy had 126,000 followers, and I was like, oh my God, you know. And so I was just appalled by that. Even um, I saw, uh, what's his face? I keep going to call him Jamie Oliver, but he's the nice guy that uh, Neil Oliver, ma- right. makes meals for Wayne's. That's, no, the other one, that's it, the one with the long hair, Neil Oliver on the GB News, saying, um, you know, a load of stuff. And it was, for me, it was, well, I don't know. He was saying we weren't. If you you'd be wrong if you were encouraging uh, violence to other people. But it's all right to say things. Well, I don't know if that's right. I wouldn't. Well, I wouldn't agree with Neil Oliver on anything really. That's just me. <laughs> I suppose but, uh, it really depends on what the things are that you're actually saying. saying you know, 
and people are going to say it. There is a danger of people being afraid to say anything. Uh, yeah. So the bal- there has to be a balance. Now, Hugh, you mentioned in your report that, for example, J.K. Rowling is, is, has raised an issue about women and police have said they're not going to treat that as a hate crime. Mm. And I think that's a sensible approach. They have to approach the thing sensibly because uh, you can't really say a woman is a, an adult female and tell people that that is not true because actually anybody can see I'm a woman, whether mm-hmm. I'm actually an adult human <coughs> female or not. And there has to be some clarity about exactly where does offence lie because you could be easily offended by something. Some of us are more easily offended than others. And if you're just saying, well, I'm really offended by what you just said, so I'm going to report you to the police. And it may be just pals sitting around a room, one of them's got drunk, or they've all got drunk, one of them said something to the other... And the next minute, one of them on the phone saying, oh, my pal just said. Yeah. You know, what is, the, what is the line going to be in regard to this hate crime issue? Do you think the bill covers that, Hugh? Well, the, the, I think the bill has actually just begun its life this week. Yeah. What happens when a new bill is published is that we really don't know how it's going to affect until it comes to court Aye. and until the police look at a thing and decide, yes, this is a crime, we're going to send it to the procurator fiscal, Aye. and then the fiscal has to say, yes, it's a crime, we're going to send it to court, and then a sheriff has to say, yes, it's a crime, you're going to jail. Aye. So there's a lot of steps. And um, what a lot of people take, for, for example, uh, Roddy Dunlop, who's the, um, the top case, he has said he doesn't think anyone is going to go to jail because they're saying something nasty. Um, so that's, that's his opinion. And in fact, in this very university where we're hiring a room today, there are a lot of people here we? think <laughs> that it's not going to be, um, it's not going to lead to anyone going to jail. Yeah. And like, you've actually got to threaten some to be violence. You've mm-hmm. got to incite and stir up hatred against the group. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying, I don't think you're a, a woman, mate. That's not stirring up hate and silence yeah. against anyone. Right. Uh, yeah. So um, according to Roddy Dunlop, no, you're not going to go to jail for saying yeah. things mm-hmm. like that. So um, you, th- you think this big, huge right wing sort of, like, oh my God, sort of hallelujah that they're doing, is just, um, just nonsense. But it's probably think? a big, a big exaggeration. I think it's a very concerted and overreaction. And yes, given uh, that the first, what, the first 3,000 complaints, the maximum uh, number of them have been against Humza Yusuf uh, himself yeah. mm-hmm. for a speech he made last year, these are not just individuals who thought, oh, we'll do mm-hmm. this. Somebody has set that yes, up. Yes, aye. Who's behind it? Where's yes. the money behind it? Follow yeah. the money? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm always yeah. saying follow the money, yeah. so, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, there's yeah. never been a case uh, uh, that I know of of a new law that's attracted such yeah. controversy on yeah, the, yeah. The, the eve of its uh, kind of coming into effect. And by the way, I think that, ki- that uh, speech by Hamza you were talking about, this is when he said there's not enough yeah. uh, balance in, yeah. uh, in public life in Scotland. Um, so he, that was actually from about four years ago or something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. Uh, but you, you're right, people have kept that on file and have been mm-hmm. waiting for this week to use it. Yeah. And nothing he said was actually wrong. Everything he said was factual. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep, there aren't very in many black opinion, faces no. in there. <laughs> Having said that, bef- before the hate bill, there have been people, mainly academia, in academia, who have been, who have lost their jobs and uh, been hounded out simply because what they're saying is the truth, but some other group are saying, no, that's not true because this is now the truth. You know, the truth is, oh, is yeah. changing. Absolutely. Always, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'll just finally uh, ask you what you think about the Ian McWhorter's comment on the law. He calls it a Clipes charter. <laughs> uh, do you think you're going to get people who, as you say, get, get into a row with somebody maybe after a drink has been taken <laughs> and then just say, I'm going to get you, I'm going to make a report on you? Are people just going to use it as a way of getting revenge on folk? I think some people might try it, but hopefully the law will have more sense than to follow through with that kind of thing. I can't see it. Yeah, I don't know. What what, what concerns me about Mm. it in another direction is the amount of administration. Mm -mm. The cost, police Scotland are having to be all retrained. They're Uh having to be told this constitutes a hate crime, this doesn't. You you mentioned non-hate crimes. It's a fine line. I don't know what, when you're coming to know hate crimes. What do you? What does that mean? <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. So it's a fine line. And the police, to be honest, and I, I'm not, you know, police enthusiast. Mm-hmm. However, it would be fair to say that they've got enough going on without adding to it. And there might be an argument that the laws that were already in place were sufficient. Actually, you know. And I, what I think is when I see all these incredible YouTube stuff going mental, you know, sorry, but absolutely going, you know, raising a frenzy over this stuff, I think they're so concerned with human rights. I don't see here one of them uh, talking about 
what's happening in Gaza and the human rights of, of the, the people but there. See, these people, that's what I would all clickbait Aye. stuff, isn't it? They, they're just trying to rile up people mm-hmm. who've got nothing better to do than sit and, go, and be riled up. Be very basically. annoyed. That's <laughs> yeah. Well, right. in opinion, you can sort of gather being Surely destroyed. Surely their people are, are, they've got human rights as well. I mean, but, but we're not in a bad position really here, are we? No. <laughs> no nobody's blowing up our buildings, right? No, no. Nobody's telling right us to way. move to the other side of the country while they search for the terrorists <laughs> and uh, nobody's That's sending true. drone missiles in our direction. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. We're Although, we're f- they are shutting down our eye, right? Let's move know. on to that one. <laughs> now, we did briefly report this last week, the Scottish... Um, I, the I Write Festival, which uh, t- used to take place right here in Glasgow uh, for 19 years, I think. This was going to be its 20th year, was that right? Or, I think or so, 19th. Like and um, it's very popular right in the centre of Glasgow, uh, and it's not happening this year because Creative Scotland, at the last minute, pulled the funding for it. Uh, so that was covered last week in our story. Uh, anything else on that? Well, on our Facebook page, uh, Darren, I've, I've sort of added in Darren McGarvey's um, lovely little video on it, which is really sums up, sums up. He's, he's saying if we take away funding from organisations like this, which are kind of ground, you know, ground up, um, then or festivals like this, then then where do we go for funding for these? If it's only commercial funding that you're looking for for arts, then we're in trouble. And I think I agree with him completely. That I, I was quite astounded. I think most people were that I right, it, it's lost its funding from Creative Scotland and and. Some other people on our, our page, Joe Murray, has added a comment on our page to talk about some other things that Creative Scotland has funded that are a wee bit. That we're wondering why. Why did that get funded? Why have I, rate, I right, been withdrawn? But I think you said something that the Scottish Government is going to look into it. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, we only know that in Parliament last week, Hamza Yusuf did say that um, he's worried and he does appreciate the, the importance of the I right Festival and he, he didn't make any promises. He didn't say... Here's the money, he said, we'll look into ways of saving it. But yeah. I'm a bit sceptical. It's going to have to get a move on because it was May, wasn't it? So yeah, yeah. this is now the start of April. So uh, they're going to have to do it pretty quick if we're going to save this year's event. It is wasn't that, a lot of money, on? though, wasn't it? Very short notice <sighs> to cancel the funding as well. As we were saying about um, uh, Creative Scotland uh, taking yes. the funding away from iRight... That's been another controversy, yeah, who funds Creative Scotland. That's um, a very last-minute decision. Yeah, mm. just normally at this time of year, artists and uh, writers, poets and, um, well, people in Glasgow are looking forward to the I Write Festival. It's been very popular. I think it's been going for about 19 years or something, built mm, up quite a big like reputation. Yeah. And uh, it's just been pulled. It's got Creative Scotland announced only last week that they're not funding this week, this year. And it would have been just about six weeks ago, uh, from now. Uh, so uh, a shocking decision, and yeah. people have, have been complaining vociferously. In fact, uh, l- last week Hamza Yusuf did say in Parliament he would regret if it didn't go ahead. Um, now, he didn't promise, but he did say he would look at it. So um, I, I still don't know if there's going to be any funding. So mm. at the moment, it doesn't look like it's going to happen. When I saw the video uh, from Darren McGarvey, I put it on our Facebook page, which you can get by. Looking at just put at News for Scotland and you'll find us on Facebook. Put the News for Scotland all together. Same for YouTube. Um, but I totally go with what he said. I, I couldn't say anything better than what he said because we said we need to fund I, right? It's a ground up art f- festival and those kind of festivals do not get commercial funding. So we absolutely need to fund it through pl- things like Creative Scotland. And I totally agree with him. I think that's, I was just shocked. So we were most of us here. Yep. Uh, well, yes, I agree. I wouldn't add anything to what Darren McGarvey said. So yeah. he's on our, obviously he's on his own Facebook, but yeah. we linked it on the News for Scotland Facebook. Uh, yeah. Well, he's making the point that it's in the middle of a city. A lot of festivals, of course, are um, out in the countryside, and maybe there's um, you know, the marquee events, as he called them, that are a bit mm-hmm. like rock music festivals. Not everybody goes to these, but this is one of the ones that actually takes place in a city. There's a lot of them take place in bijou wee towns, you know, in the borders, <laughs> or in, there's, there's wee places in England like... What's that big one in England? They have maybe... Uh, hey on one. Uh, that's right, yeah. So um, th- this is a bit unusual for one to take place in the middle of an um, established industrial city, so ordinary people have the opportunity to go there. And they did, didn't they? Uh, Glasgow folk liked I write. And uh, there's also one for young people as well. What was it called? We, we write, I think. <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> uh, so is it, is it going to happen this year? Hamza's going to have to produce some money pretty quick because it was the end of May last year. Mm-hmm. 
we do have, uh, talking about arts, we have a, an interview coming up with uh, Neil Packham from the Citizens Community uh, Arts, who, which have been carrying on even though the Citizens Theatre is obviously uh, being sort of rebuilt and will open soon, we hope. But uh, all their community work has still been carrying on, the stuff that they do in the Gorbals and the, the youth work that they do and the, and the other um, community arts and drama uh, work that they do and Neil Packham uh, is absolutely central to all that work and there's an interview coming up with him in a couple of minutes. Yeah, that is a very interesting interview, yeah, so uh, you'll be yeah, worthwhile spending, I think, about 11 and a half minutes listening to <laughs> that one. Uh, yes. It should have been 10, Hugh, but hey, I'll run over. I, I, <laughs> I, I already edited it down, about <laughs> three minutes off that already, so... Um, Fabulous. So. <laughs> that, that's about it for this week, isn't it? It is indeed. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so, uh, well, if you've been listening to us or watching us, then, so thanks for joining us in News for Scotland, and we will be going out, we hope, uh, every week now on the YouTube, and we might be doing some other things with this roving camera. Uh, we are in Glasgow, but we do intend to cover other parts of Scotland, actually. Okay. So, Please do send in your stories to us at info at newsforscotland.org and especially if you're from Dumfries or the Highlands or the Islands. Can I also ask those of you out there who might be remotely interested in recording and broadcasting that we would like your support, your physical and mental support. If you'd like to come along and participate in the programme, please get in touch with us. Absolutely. And thank Glasgow, Glasgow Caledonia, Caledonia University, University Food of the Podcast Studio for allowing us to come in here and for showing us old folk how it works. <laughs> She's speaking for herself when she says old folk. <laughs> uh, yeah, but if, if we've got anyone who's uh, better at using the equipment than we are, yeah, come along. And Most okay, definitely. so I think we'll just um, we'll be watching. Well, thanks for listening, whatever media you're getting us from. And uh, do us a favour, please, if you like what we're doing, can you pass us on in your social media? Tell some more folk about it. We've got people listening all over the world. Um, so thanks for listening. Tell people about it, and we'll be back next week. See you later. Thank you. Good afternoon, folks. It's Jeanette Hill here, and I'm speaking to Neil Pack from the Citizens Theatre. Hi, Neil. Hello there, Jeanette. Hello, it's nice to chat to you. Oh, thank you very much for agreeing to do this. I know you're a busy man. Oh. Do you want to start by just telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. I I trained as an actor many, many, many years ago, and I was one of those, you know, I really did. I really wanted to act. It was a, But uh, and I followed that through. And I did bits and pieces of acting in the bill and some other other bits and pieces on the on the stage, but then and then and then around nineteen eighty five, I think it was, I came on tour to Glasgow, and I met someone, and I met my met, uh, and then I also fell in love with Glasgow, not just with the girl I met, but with, but um, I was just thought Glasgow was an amazing place um as, as well as the person that I'd met and so <laughs> we uh I well, maybe it was about four years later I then came up to Glasgow to live and I didn't really know I didn't really know how my career was going to work out what was going to happen but it happened to be um 19 it was like 1989 and there was the garden festival but it was also building up to Glasgow City of Culture Oh, yes, and that was a great opportunity for me to meet loads of people and to st sort of start a new life in Glasgow. And I thought, well, there was Mayfest was also around at the time, which was such a such a wonderful yeah. thing. But um, yeah, Glasgow City of Culture really sparked something for me, and I started to get involved in. There was lots of community theatre going on at the time. I was asked to direct something in in a, in a in a care home in in Glasgow, and that kind of kicked it all off. I then became very sort of interested in this, and then started to lead other youth theatre groups, and then I got this job, um, Gorbals Community, uh, what was it called, Gorbals Drama Worker role at the Citizens Theatre, and yeah. I always wanted to work at the Citizens Theatre um, yeah. and at the drama school that I went to um, the Citizens Theatre was kind of heralded I was very I started out job sharing with somebody I was absolutely I was delighted to be working there 
that sort of changed my changed my life a bit. I then then I dropped I dropped the acting, and just really embraced my role at the Citizens Theatre, and I've, I've worked there ever since, and in, in a role as community drama director. Yeah, fantastic. And what kind of groups do you run? Run so many groups over the years. Mm-hmm. From one of our, I have two big sort of my babies the young company which has been running for nearly 20 years um and i I set that up the young company which is for 18 to 23 year olds and that's running to this day next year it celebrates its 20th year and also what started off as the community company but then is currently the community collective which is for adults of all ages that have free time on a Friday afternoon and are all passionate about theatre. This is all just people. They don't need to have had any experience. People come along and we have a good laugh, but we also create kind of really interesting bits of theatre. Some of this has been like on the main stage of the theatre, which is a huge thrill when people get a chance to sort of step onto the main stage, as it is for me to direct something on the main stage of the Citizens Theatre. I'm really sort of proud of these moments. Uh, yes. Direct. Yeah. Right. I've seen one of your, the last one of your, it was amazing. It was absolutely fantastic. What was it called again? That one about? Night, Night the, to Remember. The last one that we saw that was written, that was all about um, the health service, we all, oh. privatisation of the health service. And that was your, that was your youth theatre one, wasn't it? Oh, really? yes. Oh, the, yes. That was the young company one that we did. Yeah. That was in the tramway because obviously we're currently out of the building because it's of closed course, for yeah. redevelopment. The, the, building, the building's moving on and it's going to be such a fantastic as, asset oh, when it reopens. Just to go back, it was a great piece of theatre that was so innovative and, and, and so you know as sat in the audience and we're with other people next to me we, we, we kept going oh my god oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh thank you very much Jeanette I know I was really proud of it and I think the the young people did a really good job we don't we don't always get cost quite a lot to actually produce something of that yeah. high level because it's got had really high production values you know I had a really I was really pleased with the as well as all the performances the set was really good. The lighting was really oh, good. The yeah. sound was really good. And I think that's yeah. something that the that the Citizens Theatre really kind of prides itself on, is making yeah. all its work um, to a high quality, not just its main stage professional work, but throughout all its, all its work. Because we, many, well, when was that? 2010, I worked, I worked in Barlini. We had a seven year residency yeah. in um, Barlini uh, prison, which was, an ex- which was an, another extraordinary experience. Um, and we created, we created a railway platform inside the, ch- the church, inside the chapel, inside Barlini. And wow. it had like a railway <laughs> tunnel. And it actually looked like a railway platform was an extraordinary an extraordinary thing and it again it was really well lit had really brilliant sound it was part of really really good sound it was part of a project called inspiring change and yeah. the the guys that took part in that absolutely loved it and then we we uh we continued to work there for a few years um office we had seven years in there we didn't we never created anything quite of that scale but every project we did had a well, had integrity behind it yeah. and it had uh you know it gave people an opportunity to kind of explore their explore their creativity in a different, yeah, and, you know, different i know yeah yeah it's so so important this stuff is so important you hear people say it you know if if i hadn't i've done this so in neil morrissey's one it talks about it. if i hadn't I stepped in and did this if this teacher hadn't I said this to me if this community worker hadn't I done this to me my life would have went on a really different yeah. course and it, i'm human yeah i'm creative i'm human yeah absolutely no i totally agree i, I don't I think it does have transformative kind of values. Yes. I'm not saying that everybody comes out and goes, "Oh, my life yeah. is marvelous now," because obviously, <laughs> with those people inside, in you know, in inside, Bolivia, right. they've still got many other practical things to deal with when they get yeah. out, finance and, and work yeah, and all the other things and their health and all that. But 
we sort of always opened the door at the Citizens right. Theatre. Definitely. And, the, and yeah. the community collective on a Friday afternoon was a place where if guys mm. went, oh, what can I do afterwards? I've really enjoyed this. They could come along okay. on a Friday afternoon and come, al- yeah. to come along to the collective, which is a, it's a wide yeah. range of people that come along. And they're all hungry to get back into that, get back into that building. And of course, I'm part of your um, off the page, which is another yeah. aspect of your community. Do you, um, do you want to tell us a little bit yeah, about that? Yeah, off the page, <laughs> Jeanette. It's lovely to have you in off the page. It is you great. You always open up lots of interesting discussion about the plays. But with off the page, we read a play, look at the characters, look at the world around the play, the time that it was set in. It's sort of social. Um, it's social place context. in social yeah, context. context. And and the characters and the you know the issues that are surround it, and in, and hopefully laugh a lot as well. I think there's a lot about well we it started it started many years ago, but the online one which you take part in, because I suppose started yeah. during the pandemic, and it was an opportunity for people to kind of escape the other things that were going on during yeah. the pandemic and talk about something talk about something different. And then, so it runs on a when that runs on a Wednesday morning online, mm. and then in the yeah. afternoon, there's a group that meet. Um, that's been going for fifteen years. There's a group that meet of about twenty people that meet on a Wednesday afternoon. I've learned so much, you know, about different plays that I never would have really thought about reading. I mean, obviously, you started with um, the Grapes of Wrath, which was amazing. Yeah. But then they moved on to Oscar Wilde. Now, I, I was a sort of working class Scottish lassie. I've never been particularly interested, but you really opened up and taught me, oh, yeah. you know, how good he was, how, how amazing it was. Isn't it funny to think of Oscar Wilde as somebody that's kind of, you know, somebody from money and somebody that was, yeah. you know, his plays are... You know, so, don't think of them as yeah. working class plays, but actually, yeah. or, or political, but they were yeah. hugely political. They were making yeah. all sorts of statements, particularly about sort of people's sexuality, which was, yes. you know, the censorship around that yeah. time was enormous. Yeah. And he sort of brought... And position of women, he was, you taught me that how yes. much he, he was he was talking about the position of women as well. Which yeah, was absolutely. Amazing. Yeah, it, it was, yeah, it was yeah. stuff that really wasn't spoken about at the time. But he was sort of bringing that to the fore and, you know, challenging the hierarchy. Thank you very much, Neil. It's been amazing. It is amazing what you, as a worker at the Citizens, contribute to the community here in the Gorbals and to Glasgow. Oh. And uh, we're happy. To, we're happy you, we've got you. Oh, <laughs> and well, when the building open, we'll have it back again, obviously. But it's great that we've still got all the community stuff going on. Oh, thanks well, very much, Jeanette. Work. I really hope that when the new building opens, that it's a total asset to the Gorbals and to Glasgow and to the, yeah. you know, and to Scotland. Because I think it's going to be, yeah. it, it, you know, the Gorbals is being redeveloped and it feels like the yeah. Citizens Theatre is going to be kind of the icing on the cake. And yeah. when it arrives, do you mm. know, and it, um, you know, it's for just for our, our generation, it's for the next generation. And hopefully, you know, people will really treasure it and it will... That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Neil. I oh. really enjoyed talking to you and I'll, I'll see you when Off the Page starts up again. Thank you very <laughs> much, Jeanette. I really appreciate it. I really enjoyed chatting to you. Citizens Theatre brings us to an end our first show in April. Check in the website. The Citizens hope to be in the new building at the end of this year. They're hoping to have the Christmas shows on stage November, December. Okay, that's it. So uh, thanks for listening. With any luck, we'll be on YouTube with pictures next week. So we'll see you then. Bye.